Arju, how can you be both servant and leader? How can you bring out the best in people who work in your organization? In this fast paced 30 minute interactive presentation, you'll be reminded of at least three things. Servant leadership is about being servant first, yet it can make your leadership more effective. Servant leadership allows people to be creative and collaborative, resulting in more treasure dropping to the bottom line. Anyone can learn to be a servant leader. You're smiling now, aren't you? Bill Bancroft is a business coach and consultant facing over the last 15 years the same challenges we face. He works with business owners and professionals who want to be even more effective leaders and so jump their careers, businesses, and organizations to the next level. He is managing principal of Combrio, a Dallas-based coaching and consulting firm. Bill has worked with scores of individuals across the private, public, and not-for-profit sectors mm -hmm. on everything from leadership development and strategic planning to team performance and creativity. Listen carefully as Bill shares practical principles for life and leadership in this presentation called The Potato Sack Chronicle, lessons from a lifetime of serving and leading that can help you be more effective personally and professionally. Please give a warm welcome to Bill Bancroft. Thank you all, appreciate it. Good afternoon, I hope you had a good day. Good, good. So I'm gonna get right at it. I kind of feel that I, now that I know more about rot Rotary and Rotarians that I'm speaking to the choir really uh, with this topic. But, uh, but I, I hope that you'll get something from it and that you'll enjoy it. So I went looking, I went looking for this potato sack. <laughs> looking for this potato sack. I didn't know where it was. Uh, several years ago, my wife and I had, had hung it on the wall in the hallway as art. And then um, so I got tired of it. So we, so we rolled it up and, uh, and uh, put it on the top shelf of the closet in, the, in, the, uh, in our bedroom. Then concerned that the moths would get at it, we put it in a safe place. Well, if you know what a safe place means, you know that we couldn't find it. <laughs> we kept running around. <laughs> working around the house and finally our, our search focused on the cedar chest in the family room, moved the magazines off the cedar chest, opened it up, and there, there was the prized potato sack. <clears throat> this, as you can imagine, already from seeing it, is no ordinary potato sack. This potato sack is hand woven uh, on, a, on a primitive loom in Bolivia. And the yarn is, is hand spun and hand dyed and this potato sack is woven to be really strong it's it's woven to carry 50 100 150 pounds of potatoes to market um, and to withstand all matters of abuse so i i got to thinking about this potato sack and i thought well this really represents a small sliver of my life as servant and leader and i was a peace corps volunteer years ago in bolivia and working with campesinos out in the countryside, the campesinos are um, the in indigenous um, uh, farmers that grow potatoes and other crops. But then as I got to be thinking about this potato sack over, over several months, I thought, wow, this thing is really the whole empanada, as they would say in Bolivia, not enchilada, but empanada, the whole meal, right? And, and uh, a whole meal of, of working with individuals and organizations and teams and groups to work with them, to help them grow, to get to the next level, to get things done, right? Sometimes, but sometimes not. <laughs> so, so, um, so in, in turn, it caused me to ask exactly what it is that makes for a, for a strong potato sack. And why, when you're thinking about servants, servant and leader, and why it is that over the years, my potato sack has been so strong. And more importantly, how it is today for you all, how it is you can make your potato sack even stronger. Um, so this is what I want for you today. I wanna to challenge you about that, to challenge you about how you can make that potato sack stronger in leadership and how you can combine servant and leader in a way that might help you do so. So what is servant leadership anyway? 
Well, if you ask somebody who's maybe younger than I am, they might say, oh, servant leadership, that is so 15 minutes ago. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, they would be right, uh, or at least partially right, because servant leadership was first talked about in the fifth century, one of the first writings in the fifth century BC by a Chinese philosopher, Lin Zhao, who said that uh, the highest type of ruler is one whose existence the people are barely aware of. In the New Testament, Luke talks about servants' leadership. A guy named Robert Greenleaf in, the, in 1970 wrote this treatise on servant leadership, which sort of started the movement, <clears throat> started the sort of modern servant leadership movement. And he said, he said, the servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. More recently, Adam Grant, a highly sought after, highly respected professor at the Wharton School and the University of Pennsylvania has picked up the torch of servant leadership. And he writes about it in this book and other books. This is give and take. Why helping others drives our success. So ask another person, maybe a younger person, how to define servant leadership. And they might say to you, well, servant leadership is so 15 minutes ahead. Well, why would they say that? Why would they say it's so 15 minutes ahead? They would also be right, by the way. It turns out that um, what servant leadership does is it turns the power pyramid upside down so that leaders are working for their followers instead of the other way around, which is this top down, followers, followers working for leaders. And, and so what really successful business owners are finding more and more is that this kind of approach, this sort of so 15 minutes ahead approach fits with the innovative instincts of the millennial generation who like working in self-directed teams where decision-making is shared and creativity and innovation are prized, and where a servant leader both keeps fear at bay and at the same time creates and holds space for creativity to occur. So if, if I can ask you, take just a minute and a half, and in your head, sort of write the answer to this question, how can you tell if someone is servant first? You gonna give us a minute and a half or you speak? Yeah, yeah. Okay. You don't have to be asked. You don't have to be asked. You, know, you just pitch in there like a hurricane thing. People did weren't asking, can you help? They just pitched in and started doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Someone else? Well, I would say one thing that gives away that it's not a servant leader is I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it's not about I, it's one says treat people the way you'd like to be treated. And a lot of there's a lot of managers who are not leaders. Okay, good, good. So any weaving, any weaving like this weaving, right? <clears throat> is warp and weft. So the warp, the vertical, the vertical threads and the weft of the horizontal threads and together they create this, this strong fabric in this strong potato sack. So I'm gonna kind of divide my talk, the rest of my talk into the warp and the weft, right? So the warp would be servant as leader, the weft would be leader as servant. So, and, and so I'm gonna start with the first one with two sort of different stories and approaches. So I set out to find the silver bullet about leadership 15 years ago. And uh, I thought, well, there had to be one. Um, after all, the Lone Ranger had silver bullets, right? And he had a horse named Silver. And, uh, but seriously, people have been studying and talking about and reading about and writing about leadership have been for decades, for centuries, for millennia, right? I didn't know enough about it, I didn't think. Um, if I could find out about it, I'd be much more valuable working with business people like yourselves, helping you to go to the next step, helping you to realize your dreams. 
Um, but, but I thought, um, and I thought I was really, I was quite confident that I could find out what that was. I could find the answer because I've been a journalist. I've been a journalist for several years working, um, working in print journalism. And I'd done investigative story after investigative story. I'd, I'd interviewed scores of people. I loved being a journalist. I feeding inside of me is the heart of a journalist. And I love the thrill of the chase. I still even own a trench coat, right? Like <laughs> journalists wear and like one of my favorite television detectives from years oh, ago, Columbo. Okay. There you go, right? I'm not that old. Right. You, re <laughs> yeah, you remember Columbo, the way he looked at people and the way he asked questions. So, so I, I really felt I could, I could do this. So what set me on this journey to discover more about leadership was a, was a basically a career change in 2002. I, I had been this journalist that I talked about and I had uh, been uh, working with a big four accounting firm. Uh, and then that, that came to an end. I needed, wanted to do something else. So, so I worked with a, a friend and a colleague and a mentor and we looked at all the things in my past career and things that we really liked, enjoyed doing, and that I had liked and enjoyed doing. And we had found a few kernels, we put them in a pile, and I said, what's that? And he said, well, that's OD. And I said, well, what's OD? And he said, well, that's organization development. I said, well, <laughs> what's organization development? <laughs> and he said, well, it's about leaders, it's about culture, and it's about teams and how they operate. I think, it's, I think you'd find it really interesting. Why don't you, why don't you kind of look into that? So that set me that set me on the journey, and I read book after book, and I went to seminar after seminar and conference after conference, and over a period of time, I learned how to do strategic planning three different ways, and to to work with others to do it, and I learned how to build strong teams, and I learned how to figure out whether a culture was toxic or or not. Um, I learned about change and change management and how you work with organizations to facilitate that, and using all of those tools and processes that I that I picked up on, I was I was able to to build quite a client a client list both in the public, private, and not for profit sectors. So uh, it 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 was it was really really a good period of time until about three years ago I figured something here is missing. Something I'm not getting something because as much success as I had, I also found that leaders weren't changing, teams weren't reaching that high performance level, cultures were still toxic, 20% of change projects, 20 plus percent of change projects, only that many were successful. Something was missing and I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I, it was sort of like this mist, this something that was covering it up and I was able to penetrate to get to the other side and what I really discovered, what I really, really discovered is that there, there is no silver bullet. That thing I was chasing doesn't exist. There is no silver bullet. It's really just about you and I and what we bring. Um, so, so just to drill down on that, success is, is really working with people. Um, it's, it's really about more than the process and tools. It's really about about the people. It's like it's like the process and tools are benign, like Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, which is this incredible piece of work, right? And written nearly 200 years ago, the score is exactly the same. It's who plays it and who conducts it that makes the difference. That so so the magic is not in the content. The magic is in in the delivery. It's in how you show up. Who you are, how you show up, how how what you say resonates with the people, so that you know whether whether it's working or not. And and so recognizing there is no silver bullet, and that it's about you and your character, and that what I said, how you show up, playing your music for people who want to hear it, sort of bringing everything from the inside. That's what really makes the difference with effective leadership. So I, the next place I want to go, the second piece of this has to do with mindset. Um, and, and so there's, there's three things that I believe sort of 
at my core, absolutely, after a period, a lifetime of experience. The first is that effective leadership will shut you down. I'm sorry, effective leadership is something you owe yourself, something you owe others, and something you owe the world. The next thing is that is that a fixed mindset will shut you down and a growth mindset will set you free. And the third thing is that winning is playing a continuous game, right? If you play a game that's finite, there are winners and losers, and if you win, you still have lost. The game's over, and, and you probably have people who don't like you very much anymore. So there's not time to talk about all three, so I'm gonna pick the second one, which is, which is about the fixed mindset. Um, I confess uh, that I have really struggled today to be here today to put this talk together. Really, really struggled. And um, part of it is fear and part of it is ego. So my bookkeeper, Natalie, came into my office this morning, sat down and, and she said, she came in to give me a pep talk. And she said, you exude servant leadership. It just like comes out of your spores. You talk about it all the time. You talk about, um, for example, how you turned around a failing school in South Dallas. And now it's like one of the crown jewels of the South Dallas Fair Park area. You talk about how you helped start sewing cooperatives in rural parts of Honduras, serve 50 women, um, where their incomes are less than $2,000 a year, and you've given them dignity and self-respect, and they've been able to work while their children are there. Um, you talk about how you've started a business, a consulting business that's been successful, that's helped clients, most recently about in the city of Mesquite, where they've got four square miles that they've annexed, and what to do about that, bringing a group of citizens together to have a two-day conversation about how to do that. So, so you, you know, you know about this this topic, but still, fear, still fear. I'll flop. <laughs> the talk won't flow. I won't be able to get my message across. It won't resonate. And then ego, right? Ego. I built this business. I know what I'm doing. And, and, but the world has changed and communication isn't what it is and messages aren't what they were. And in order to connect with people as the world changes, I have to change and I have to connect differently and I have to understand communication tools better than I understand them. I didn't want to, right? I was like, I was like in a fixed mindset. Does that make sense? I was that was that's where I was in a fixed fixed mindset. So what I can tell you now is that I'm here because you can see me right through the TV camera and you personally I'm here. So I've learned a little and that I can do this. And um, and this is kind of what I've what I've learned, sort of the foundation of what I've learned. And that is is that I have kind of a new mantra. It's called fail and learn, fail and learn, fail again, and learn again. It's not about being perfect the first time. It's about going out and continuing to grow. So, so I, I brought um, this book, Carol Dweck. She's a professor at Stanford. She wrote this really terrific book called Mindset. And she says something really important. She says many things important about, it's about the effort. She said, believing that your qualities are carved in stone, the fixed mindset creates an urgency to prove yourself over and over. By contrast, she says, thinking that your basic qualities are things you can cultivate through your efforts and that whatever just happened is the starting point, that creates the space for you to take the next steps in your own growth. So for a servant leader, what this really says to me is it's also 15 minutes ago, and it's also 15 minutes ahead. So another quick 30 seconds, be thinking about, and then do a shout out. What is it in the way of leadership that you want to learn next? Can I answer for a little bit? Go ahead. 
<laughs> oh, no, you just want to be able to have people uh, work with you when there, there is something. People just come forward. You don't have to individually ask. I wish people would just come, you know, like working with the evacuees or working with the food. These are people that haven't been told to do anything. The opportunities are there. You just go do it. Just do it. <laughs> just do it. Just get out there. Anyone else have a comment? I have one from the uh, online world, if I might. Okay, please. Um, so from leadership of when you see potential in someone and they are too scared and can't recognize it themselves, how to counter and really call forth those abilities in that individual so that they can believe in themselves as you do. That's, that's really neat. Good. Okay. So that's that's on the list for learning. Super. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go into that space that begins to answer these questions. Okay. Um, and I'm gonna look at the weft of the potato sack. Remember we talked about the warp, which was which was servant as leader. Now we're gonna talk about the weft, which is leader as servant. Okay. So who here has ridden on Air Force One with the president? Raise your hands. Anybody? Anybody know? Anybody online? <laughs> I've been in Air Force One's retired up in Seattle. Yeah. Does that count? <laughs> the president was there. So, so I have twice. Okay. And and um, it was a terrific experience. It's a lot of fun um, and uh, really amazing to see how all that works. Um, the first experience was probably the most memorable because I almost missed the plane. <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was sent to be on Air Force One, be in the press pool when I was a journalist um, uh, with the first President Bush, and it was right around New Year's, and he was in South Texas at a ranch, and he was hunting with I think Jim Baker, who was then the Secretary of State, may have been head of the Security Council, and then the owner of the ranch, and he um, so I was to pick him up, be part of this motorcade as he was coming out of the ranch to go on Air Force One and then to Houston where he would spend New Year's. So there were two or three or four of us to join the pool. And the White House took us on a bus um, to the, well, not really the entrance to the, to the ranch. It was sort of halfway to the entrance of the ranch on a very narrow dirt road, lots of brush, and uh, kind of just let it off. And we found ourselves basically by the side of the road in a ditch with like two feet two feet deep below the uh, top of the road. And I remember looking over after they dropped us off, and I remember seeing a sheriff's car with the red lights, you know, flashing all the red lights, and then another sheriff's car with another bunch of flashing red lights, and then a van, and then two big black Cadillacs, you know, with, with uh, presidential flags uh, flying on both fenders. One was a decoy, and Bush and his wife Barbara were in the other one. And I thought, how out of place are these two big black Cadillacs in the middle of nowhere on a dirt road? Anyway, following these Cadillacs were another couple of uh, vehicles and then, a, and then a Suburban. And the idea was the Suburban would quickly stop, open the door, we would get in. I had my briefcase and suitcase, and boom, we'd be off. Well, when the door opened, the Suburban was already packed full of people. And we were two feet down in this ditch. And how I just kept trying to get in. And finally, somebody pulled me in by my shoulders and pulled in my suitcase and briefcase. And they said, you better hurry up or we're going to leave you. And the door closed and off we were. So it's interesting. I, I was uh, uh, off we went to, to get on Air Force One. I wrote, the, along with another journalist, the pool report that day. So the pool report is the report that goes out to all the press that follows the president. And I looked at it. And I saw that uh, that uh, the quail count, which was that number of quail that they killed, Bush and so on, was uh, was 20, and that uh, Jim Baker had uh, killed a 19-pound turkey and had been dressed, and it was on the plane that Marlon Fitzwater, then the press secretary, said, "Well, we eat our game." Uh, and then there's a fashion note about what Bush had worn at the barbecue the day before. Um, in Beeville, and then some some stuff about logistics, uh, and that was it. 
And I, what I remember now is that the most important thing that Bush did that day never made it into the pool report and never made it into any of the newspapers. So here's a guy on vacation. Do you all remember uh, his program, The Thousand Points of Light? Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So it was a way that he would honor a person or an organization every day of his presidency. So he, he that honoree, the press release was there, that honoree never made it into the pool report. And so that honoree never got, got the recognition that was due uh, from the president. So the moral of the story for me is that it's really hard to help somebody. And as Rotarians, you probably have experienced that, how hard it is to help somebody. Um, uh, even for the president of the United States, even in a case where it's really simple. And so my advice when it comes to being a servant leader, bettering your skills, your set is that helping people can be much, much tougher than you think. Come to the work with preparation and flexibility. Be prepared for it to test your patience and be flexible about what you can do about it. Have a bunch of plan Bs ready. And I think this piece of it is even more important. Remembering that serving others is different from helping or fixing. So serving is different than helping and fixing, right? Fixing means broken, helping means needy, and, and helping and fixing risk trampling people's dignity and self-respect. And when you think about Hurricane Harvey and you think, well, they just need the help right now, I get that. It's when, it's the months and years that come, right? When people really have much more ability to help themselves that you risk you risk that, you risk the helping instead of the serving so that you risk trampling on people's dignity and self-respect. So serving is different, as I, as I like to say, it's a back and forth between equals and it trades on that dignity and self-respect. So one last story, what am I doing on time? Oh, I don't know. Oh, we said that in a minute. Okay, great, good. So one last story. Um, and. This is about being in Toronto, where you're going to be, right, for your next uh, for your next uh, big international conference. Um, so it's the leader's job, I think, to set the tone. The leader's job to set the tone to create and hold space for people to be creative and collaborative. And it's especially important for the servant as leader. It means putting people on offense, not defense. It means mitigating fear and amping up the creativity. So a few months ago, I think it was in March, I went to Toronto and I went to Toronto because Toronto had a problem, it was a big problem, it was about refugees. The city was, was had many, many more refugees than they could house and there was a housing crisis. There were stories of, of cabbies who would take money out of their pockets and give it to the people who, you know, front desk at a hotel and say, here, I'm gonna buy a room for this family tonight. So they wouldn't have to stay out in the cold because some of those refugees had families with small kids and there were oldsters and youngsters and people in between. And and one of the one of the workers that I talked to as part of this project that I interviewed was a relief worker and had been working with refugees, told me that he took a whole family home with him to live uh, in the basement of his house. He thought, well, they'll just be here a couple of weeks. They were there for months. And they were there for months because it takes that long just to get the paperwork completed, just to get people on their feet and get jobs and enough money that they can then go and get an apartment and put the put the deposit down. So this was this is, it was really kind of a crisis, and and the traditional approaches for solving the problem hadn't worked. So in traditional process, like well, what are the best practices somewhere else or um, adapting some kind of plan that had been in place at some other in some other location, or getting a group of civic leaders together to mull it over and discuss it. None of that worked. So it's interesting. Our challenge, my challenge, along with 19 other people, was to find a solution for the problem. And we didn't know each other. We had come from the US and Canada to Toronto. Um, we had been assigned to four groups and we had four days. And I'm thinking, four days, really? Are you kidding me? Four days to solve this kind of a problem, this huge kind of a problem? 
And they said, yep, yeah, four days, that's all you have. I wonder, can you feel the panic that I felt about how we were going to, you know, in some way be able to contribute in this kind of a situation? Well, interestingly enough, we did solve the problem. We actually came up with four different solutions because we were working in four different teams. And the way we did it, there were, there were two elements in the way we did it. The first was the way we came at it, the sort of the specifics of the of the problem solving approach. And the second was the underlying, the underlying thinking, understanding it is about solving these problems. And it goes to the online question that you had about people who have fear and how you how you mitigate that fear. So here's some of the specifics about how we worked. We worked in diverse teams and we were self-directed in terms of leadership. And it was like jazz. It was like the leadership passed from person to person, just kind of like improvisationally. Um, we we had a terrific space to work with. Was, we were not housed in some <laughs> dank, dark conference room in some big downtown hotel. Instead, we were in a neighborhood center in a room that was painted all white. It was two stories tall, and it had a great big bank of windows for light to come in and for us to sort of feel the vibrancy of the neighborhood where where this was. Um, we we used brainstorming and we had brainstorming six, seven, eight different ways. Brainstorming so that people could, even the most reticent of, of the people who were in the team so that they felt that they could be a part of it and they could contribute. Um, we we focused, it was messy and it was messy on purpose and and we went fast. So that was another way to kind of divert ourselves. You couldn't like go and sit and say, oh, uh oh, I'm, you know, this is this isn't going to work. And finally, we we built we built prototypes. So it wasn't just a concept that we came up with. We actually had to build a prototype so we could see how it might work. Okay. And the prototypes were really um, they were they were really very, you know, can't. The word is just, they, they weren't sophisticated. They were just very unsophisticated kind of prototypes. So my team, I came up with, I thought it was the best idea because it's my team, right? But my team came up with an idea that we would uh, create a market. We would create a market where people who had extra rooms in their houses or their apartments could donate those and put them up on the market. And the social workers who are working with, the, with these refugees could go to the market, find the rooms, and make the best match between the, those who needed and those who had. And, and part of the reason that that worked was because of the experience of that, we thought. And um, it would make the people who gave smile, and it would make the people who needed smile. And, and so there was that emotional, uh, emotional piece of it that, that really made it work. So kind of understanding why that is and why all of this came together, how we're able in four days to come up with this idea, it's important because it goes to neuroscience and what people are discovering more and more about neuroscience, how the brain works and how it is that you can keep people on offense and keep them away from playing defense. So one of the things that's going on there is pivot thinking. And the different things that we did, and I think we went through 11, 12, 13 steps along the way. At each one of those steps, there was the possibility that we would shut down, that we would shift back to the normal way of solving problems, which is A plus B equals C, right? And what it did is, is it, 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 it we were, the way it worked was, is that, is that the, each of these things that steps were designed so that we would continue to be creative, continue to be collaborative, continue to challenge ourselves to go forward. So there's a lot of new things going on in neuroscience. And in neuroscience, I think for servant leaders, it's important to watch. Um, it's, it's, it's a, okay, so what it, what it really does is it gives you new and different and better ways, I think, um, for the content and for the delivery, and so that you can go deeper and stronger in those areas. So, so closing. I'd like to challenge you, go back to that challenge. Um, so what, now what? How will you be so 15 minutes ahead? 
what, how will you serve others so they can better deal with their fears about stepping up to lead? And how will you weave a stronger potato sack for yourself? So in short, will you blend servant and leader together to become a better leader? So who has the first question? 